We now have a good understanding of the anatomy of the fractured bone and how it can heal. We've fully assessed our patient and instigated all the necessary treatment to stabilise them. We've got some good x-rays and we can see exactly what type of fracture we're dealing with. Can we go straight in now and repair this bone? The answer unfortunately is probably no or we will make mistakes. X-rays should be taken once the patient is stable, but it's very unlikely that surgery will be done under the same anaesthetic. Now is the time to sit down with a coffee and the x-rays and have a good think about how you're going to go about repairing this fracture. From experience, I'd often do this at the end of the day and then get all the necessary equipment looked out and sterilised for the following morning. Trying to plan a fracture repair and look out implants in a busy clinic with everybody talking, phones ringing, dogs barking, this is a recipe for disaster. Taking some valuable quiet time now to plan carefully will pay dividends and it will reduce stress levels during surgery. In this section, we're going to discuss what to consider when planning a specific repair, but we're only going to be talking about planning surgeries using intermodullary pins, external skeletal fixators, um, orthopedic cerclage wires, etc. This means that some of the fractures you see will be candidates for amputation since there's many fracture types not amenable to fixation with these implants. I'll talk about the importance of having different plans going into surgery, but in the circumstances we are working in and the patients we're working on, one of those plans will always have to be limb amputation. We're, we will not be able to repair every or even most fractures, but I'm hoping that we can at least look at repairing some of these long bone, avulsion and growth plate fractures that we see, particularly in the younger street dogs. As already mentioned, fractures are not usually the priority in a patient that's been involved in a road traffic accident, but rather the other potential life-threatening circumstances that might be present. Having said this, there's a couple of fracture types that should be considered as emergencies, and those are open fractures and articular fractures. These we cannot sit back for several days while we decide what to do with them, or our chances of success will be lowered dramatically. On the left here, is a condylar fracture, a lateral con condylar fracture of the elbow, uh, and on the right is an open fracture of the tibia of a cat which was shot with an air rifle. The air pellet penetrated the bone uh, and travelled down the medullary canal, wedging itself along with some hair, dirt and skin. Both of these fractures require treatment as soon as the animal is stable. In an ideal world, with any fracture, we'd be looking at all the factors playing a role, that includes the patient age, the type of the fracture, the forces acting on the fracture, etc. And then deciding which method of repair would be best suited for the job. If we look at the x-rays and say, how can I fix this with an IM pin or an ESF, an external fixator, then we're allowing the implants available to dictate how we repair the fracture. And this is more likely to lead to compromises and possible failure. This, however, is the position many of us are in. Uh, so we need to try and appreciate which types of fracture lend themselves to repair with the implants we've got available. We're not working in an ideal world scenario here as regards orthopaedics and fracture repairs. We've spoken already about preoperative x-rays. At least two orthogonal views with the joints above and below the fracture should be included. It's also good practice to x-ray the contralateral limb for comparison and for measuring implants. An orthogonal simply means views taken at 90 degree angles to each other. So here on the left, we've got a medial lateral view of a fractured humerus. And on the right, we've got a craniocaudal view of the same fracture. Apologies for the artifacts here. There's obviously the obvious displacement of the fracture ends uh, on this medial lateral view but we need vo both views to be able to see where the bone ends are sitting in relation to each other, and this makes locating them during our surgical approach simpler. On the image on the left, the distal segment here has moved cranially quite significantly with respect to the proximal segment, but we've no idea where these segments lie in the mediolateral plane. In the image on the right here, we can see that they're reasonably aligned mediolaterally, with the distal segment lying slightly medially. In this example of a spiral mid-shaft tibial fracture in a puppy, there appears to be minimal displacement on the craniocaudal view here, whereas in the medial lateral view, we can see that the distal segment has been displaced slightly cranially. Again, you'll see that we've included the joints above 
and below the fracture in both of these x-rays. Study your x-rays carefully, look at the fracture type and assess the forces acting on the fracture. We'll talk about these forces in a minute. You can then start to work out what implants you need to utilise to counteract these forces and to provide relative stability at the fracture site to allow secondary or indirect bony healing to occur. Again, we're working within certain boundaries here, so it might be that the fracture in front of you just isn't repairable using the implants we've discussed. For example, a simple oblique mid-shaft closed femoral fracture in a young dog is something we can definitely repair with an IM pin and correctly placed orthopaedic cerclage wires. Likewise, a simple transverse mid-shaft closed tibial fracture in a young dog could be repaired using an IM pin with an accompanying type 1 simple external skeletal fixator device. Even a highly comminuted tibial fracture in a young dog but it could be repaired with a more robust external skeletal fixator device alone. All of these fracture types lend themselves to repair with the implants we're discussing and in young dogs the healing potential is in our favour. On the other hand, an elderly or malnourished dog with a severely comminuted humeral or radial fracture would be likely to require some form of plating in order to achieve success. This fracture type is not as amenable to the use of IM pins and external skeletal fixator combinations and the length of time required for healing to occur would mean that our implants would quite possibly fail before bony union was achieved. We'll talk about specific long bone fractures and ideal methods of repair for each later. A simple way to look at this is that what we want the fracture to heal before our implants fail, not the other way around. When we're placing plates and screws directly in the bone, these will remain in place for many months, years or even indefinitely, so a fracture that takes a long time to heal is not a problem. If, however, we're relying on IM pins and external skeletal fixators and orthopaedic cerclage wire and arthrodesis wires, then we can expect these implants to lose stability sooner. Why? Because they do not provide absolute fracture site stability and the micromotion encouraged at the fracture site for secondary indirect bone healing to occur will also contribute to eventual implant loosening. So in a way, we're going to be limited to certain types of fracture with the methods we have at our disposal. The methods we have at our disposal. The others will be better off with amputation. And remember what I said at the beginning, if we look at the x-rays and say, how can I fix this using an IM pin or an ESF? then we're allowing the implants available to dictate how we repair the fracture and this is more likely to lead to compromise and possible failure. Look at the x-rays and patient type and ask yourself is this repairable using an IM pin or external skeletal fixator? If the answer is no then proceed to amputation. Uh, this, is, this is a very busy slide, I, I apologise for that but the, the take home points are study your x-rays thoroughly and assess the forces at play. Consider the implants needed to prove relative stability to the fracture. We're not looking for absolute, just relative stability. Take into account the fracture characteristics and patient suitability. We need the fracture to heal before our implants fail. IM pins and external skeletal fixators will not provide the same degree of stability as plates and screws. And IM pins and external skeletal fixators will not provide stability for as long as plates and screws. Not all fractures are amenable to fixation using IM pins, ESF and wire. If the patient type and fracture are not suitable for IM pin ESF, amputate. One of our principal aims in using the implants at our disposal is to stabilise the fracture doing as little damage to the associated soft tissues as possible. This biological or look but don't touch open approach to the fracture site is essential since we are relying on secondary bone healing and callus formation which needs a good blood supply. With intramedullary pins and external skeletal fixators etc we will still in most cases need to visualise the fracture site to confirm good reduction but there is no need to strip away soft tissues to allow contouring or placement of bone plates. The surrounding soft tissues are our friends here, so preserve them. In some cases, 
It is possible to direct pin long bones or place external skeletal fixation devices without disturbing the fracture envelope, but in most cases you will need some degree of exposure, definitely if you are placing cerclage wires around an oblique fracture. Certain fracture types biologically are better candidates for repair using pins, arthrodesis wires and external skeletal fixators because they've got better inherent healing abilities. I'm talking about, for example, fractures involving the growth plates or concellus metaphyseal bone in young dogs, green stick fractures in young dogs, or spiral and oblique fractures associated with low energy injuries. High energy comminuted fractures with their associated soft tissue and vascular damage and open infected fractures are biologically poor candidates for repair using pins, wires and ESFs. Having said this, a severely comminuted contaminated open fracture would require complex external fixation to stabilise it since we don't want to be inserting metal implants into a contaminated site. This would contradict what we said earlier about the implant failing before the fracture had healed, so these are not simple decisions. Should we reconstruct the fracture or not? If the fracture is easily reconstructable, then this is, preferred, this is the preferred route, although the surgeon might decide it's not necessary. For example, in a very young patient where healing will be rapid and invasive surgery and exposure of the fracture site isn't warranted. Reconstruction means exposing the fracture site, and so it's a compromise between losing this biological advantage in order to achieve a more stable reconstructed long bone. If reconstructing the fracture is likely to result in significant soft tissue damage and the placement of multiple implants at the fracture site, then it may be worth avoiding this and instead selecting a repair method that maintains the length and alignment of the long bone and creating an environment for secondary or indirect bone healing to occur. As a rule, simple transverse oblique or spiral fractures with two pieces are much more amenable to simple reconstruction than comminuted fractures with more than three pieces. In our situation, using pins, ESFs and wires, then I'd be looking to reconstruct most of these simple long bone fractures with an open but minimally invasive or look but don't touch approach to the fracture site. I'd be quite happy to place an external skeletal fixator on much more complicated mid-shaft long bone fractures without visiting the fracture site, i.e. a closed approach, but this is very difficult to do without easy access to x-rays to assess alignment. The image on the left is a non-reconstructable fracture. It's a high energy comminuted fracture of the distal humerus in an adult cat. Based on that information, we, all, we, we also know that this is not a fracture that is biologically suitable to repair using intermedullary pins or a simple external skeletal fixator, nor is it in an area of the bone that these method, methods would be of particular use. And I'll give you more on that later. Trying to reconstruct this particular fracture would involve significant damage to the soft tissue envelope and remaining blood supply to the bony fragments, therefore increasing the risks of delayed healing and losing the blood supply altogether and possibly a non-union. This is a fracture where a simple repair is not possible, so amputation would be the sensible option. The fracture on the right, this x-ray you've already seen, um, is a mid-shaft, simple mid-shaft spiral fracture of the tibia in a young animal. This is definitely reconstructable and also biologically and anatomically a good candidate for repair using any of the techniques available to us. If you are confident, this could be approached completely closed by direct pinning the tibia and placing a simple ESF frame or using a simple ESF frame alone. Or it could benefit from a limited approach to reconstruct the fracture and place cerclage wires to augment an intermedullary pin or external skeletal fixator. This is an x-ray of the repair of the reconstructable fracture in the previous slide. The decision taken here was to perform a limited open approach and reconstruct the fracture site using two cerclage wires and support this with a simple type 1A external skeletal fixator. An IM pin was not used in order to prevent damage to the proximal tibial growth plate that you can see here. Uh, and the cerclage wires with the open approach was used since despite the x-ray appearance this was actually quite an unstable fracture. I would expect rapid healing in a young animal in about six weeks or so here. In order to decide which implants we're going to employ to stabilise the fracture, we need to look at the forces acting on the fracture site and understand them. 
Then we select the implants that will neutralize these forces. With this information and the decision on whether we wish to reconstruct the fracture or not, we can then make a sound decision on our method of repair. There are four main forces that act on diaphyseal long bone fractures, and these are bending, rotation, shear, and compression. And these forces are predominantly caused by the pool of muscles attached to the bones. There is a fifth force which can act on fractures called avulsion or tension, although this is not seen in diaphyseal fractures, but rather at the point of insertion of tendons and ligaments. For example, the tibial tuberosity, olecranon and greater trochanter. These often occur in young animals and occur through the growth plate or physis and they're repaired in a specific manner, which we're going to discuss later. Bending and rotation forces are pretty self-explanatory and the red arrows in these diagrams illustrate the direction of force. Shear forces are much greater in oblique fractures. In simple transverse fractures, they can be reduced dramatically if the fracture maintains in reduction by itself, if the fracture edges, if the fracture edges interdigitate with each other. Repair methods are, are basically classified into primary and secondary methods of repair. Ideal primary repair methods for long bone fractures include plates, and that would be your dynamic compression plates, your LCDCPs, locking plates, various specialised plates, etc. External skeletal fixation devices can be primary repair methods, and there are various forms of these, including linear, circular and hybrid, and also interlocking nails. These can all be used alone to repair most fractures. Secondary methods of repair include intermodellary pins, orthopedic circlash wire, arthrodesis wires, and lag screws without using a plate. These should not be used alone without one of the primary methods mentioned above. This poses a problem for us since we do not have access to the methods above. There are certain scenarios when these secondary methods of repair can be used alone and these are what we will be looking into in more detail. Situations where these secondary repair methods can be used alone uh, would include the use of intermodellary pins and orthopedic cerclage wire for long oblique diaphyseal long bone fractures, the use of arthrodesis wires alone for repair of long bone physial fractures, and the use of arthrodesis and orthopedic cerclage wire for tension band repairs of avulsion fractures. We will also look at the repair of other long bone fractures using IM pins with additional basic external skeletal fixator constructs to improve stability. For example, a transverse tibial fracture where we can place an IM pin but no cerclage wire. The IM pin is not enough on its own, you will get rotation forces, so we need additional support from a basic external skeletal fixator. We can also use simple external skeletal fixation, fixation constructs alone or to support interfragmentary orthopedic cerclage wires when, for example, intermodellary pinning is not desirable, e.g. a young animal with open growth plates. When repairing long bone fractures without reconstructing the bone, we want to achieve at least 50% overlap of the bone ends on two post-op x-rays and less than five degrees of angular or rotational malalignment. This is theory and it will be impossible to assess accurately without immediate access to post-op x-rays, however it's something we want to achieve. Significant angular and rotational abnormalities post-op will result in ongoing lameness and joint problems. Our patients are a little bit more tolerant of angular deformity in the craniocaudal plane than they are in the mediolateral plane since the latter has a greater effect on weight-bearing forces in the joints at either end of the long bone. If the bone heals with a significant angular deformity, then refracture is a real risk once implants are removed due to normal load-bearing forces through the abnormally shaped bone. We use our implants to neutralise the forces acting on the fracture, and each fracture will have different forces acting on it, and we need to neutralise these forces that are causing the instability. A comminuted tibial fracture, for example, here, will be susceptible to all four of the above-mentioned forces. And we're talking about compression, rotation, 
shear and bending forces. On the right here, we've got an example of a transverse inter interdigitating tibial fracture, which will be stable to compression forces, but susceptible to bending forces. It will also exhibit reasonably good resistance to both rotational and shear forces, depending on the degree of interdigitation. Plates and external skeletal fixators are able to counteract all four of the forces that act on diaphyseal long bone fractures, although plates have a poorer resistance to bending forces than external skeletal fixators. If too short a plate is used to repair a long bone fracture, then it's possible that bending forces will cause eventual breaking of the plate through cyclical loading. Intermodullary pins have an excellent resistance to bending forces, but very little, if any, effect against any of the other three forces. So from this, we can, we can see that for our intermodullary pin fixation to be successful, it must be accompanied by some form of additional fixation method. For example, orthopedic cerclage wire in long oblique, oblique fractures and ESF frames in other long bone fractures. Let's talk about intermodullary pinning first. Intermodullary pins come in a large range of diameters and are steel pins with sharp trocar points at either end. IM pins provide excellent resistance to bending forces with some resistance to shear forces. They are unable to counteract either rotational or compressive forces. Long bones amenable to IM pinning are the femur, the tibia, the humerus and the ulna. The radius cannot be pinned. IM pins can be placed in one of two manners, either retrograde or normal grade. Retrograde pinning is easier to do and involves inserting the pin into the medullary canal at the fracture site and advancing it proximally until it emerges from the bone. The pin is grasped as it emerges, the fracture reduced and the pin then advanced into the distal segment, seating in the distal metaphyseal bone or epiphysis. And I'll show photos in the next slide. Normal grade pinning involves inserting the pin into the epiphysis at the proximal end of the bone, advancing it down through the medullary canal across the fracture site and into the distal metaphysis or epiphysis. This latter technique is a little harder to accomplish, but it gives full control over pin entry points. The femur and humerus are both bones that can be pinned in either a retrograde or normal grade fashion. The tibia, however, can only be pinned in a normal grade fashion. If you try to retrograde pin a tibia, the pin will definitely end up in the stifle joint, something we, don't, we do not want. We'll concentrate on the function of the IM pin and how to use them in this talk and discuss more specific fractures and the differences between each of the bones when it comes to using these implants later on. When retrograde pinning the femur, have the hip positioned in extension and the limb adducted, and this will reduce the risk of sciatic nerve trauma proximally. When retrograde pinning the humerus, Aim the pin in a cranial direction in order to avoid the shoulder joint and also laterally so that when it's advanced down the canal it will seat in the larger medial epicondyle. When pinning the humerus of cats, remember that only about 50% of cats have an open medial epicondyle and so the pin will most likely need to be seated proximal to the supratrochlear super foramen. This is the humerus of a cat being pinned in a retrograde manner. The fracture site has been exposed and the pin is inserted and advanced proximally. It's difficult to see here, but the pin is being aimed cranially and laterally within the medullary canal. The second image shows the pin end now at the level of the fracture site and the Jacob's chuck here has been removed and attached to the proximal end of the pin. The fracture is then reduced and held in reduction with a pair of pointed reduction forceps. These are the pointed reduction forceps, and you can see the long oblique fracture line being held in reduction. And the pin is then advanced down carefully across the fracture site and into the distal segment. You can see in this case that we've used three orthopedic cerclage wires to augment the intermodullary pin. The cerclage wires are necessary in this long oblique fracture to counteract the significant shear forces but also the rotational and compressive forces at action. And we spoke earlier about limited open approaches to preserve soft tissue and this is what we're doing here. We've only exposed the amount of bone necessary to be able to reduce this fracture and apply the three cerclage wires. No more.
These images show the entry points when normal grade pinning these long bones, and we'll cover this in more detail later. But with the humerus, we start the pin at the craniolateral aspect of the greater tubercle and drive it distally. With the femur, we walk the intramedullary pin off the medial edge of the greater trochanter until it drops into the trochanteric fossa and then advance it distally into the medullary canal. And with the tibia, the IM pin is started just medial to the attachment of the patellar tendon. Pins can be inserted with either a low-speed power drill or hand chuck. With a hand chuck, it's important to maintain good action to prevent pin wobble and the creation of an oval exit hole, which will not hold the pin as well. Rotation of the chuck must be done axially from the wrist. Using the low-speed power drill eliminates pin wobble and also probably means the surgeon will concentrate more on pin trajectory, so more accurate pin placement is likely. When used to using, the drill is an excellent tool also for giving feedback to where you are in the bone. If using an IM pin in combination with circlage wire on a long oblique fracture, then select a pin approximately 70% of the diameter of the medullary canal at its narrowest point. If using a pin in combination with an ESF to provide additional stability, then select a pin 20-50% to of the diameter of the medullary canal at its narrowest point, and this allows enough space for the passage of the ESF pins. When using an ESF in combination with an IM pin in either the humerus or the femur, the IM pin can be left exposed proximally rather than being cut off and buried, and then used to connect to the ESF frame. And this is called a tied-in configuration, and it can increase the stability of the repair by approximately 30%. The tied-in external skeletal fixator combats rotational and compression forces not addressed by the IM pin, but it also gives additional resistance to bending and shear forces. Remember, you can always replace a small IM pin with a thicker one, but not the other way around. When applying an external skeletal fixator to complement intermedullary pinning, the IM pin is placed first, followed by the ESF. So when using an IM pin on its own or with orthopedic circlage wire, the pin should occupy approximately 70% of the diameter of the medullary canal at its narrowest part. If anything, this pin is slightly too wide in that it occupies over 70% of the canal. There is a risk of compromise to the intramedullary blood supply if the pin is too wide. Although this slide illustrates a locking plate, it is the same principle as when using an ESF with an IM pin. An IM pin with an ESF or plate, the pin should occupy approximately 20 to 50% of the diameter of the medullary canal at its narrowest part. Ideally, this fracture would be repaired with a laterally applied plate, but financial circumstances didn't allow for this. So an IM pin was used with a very simple external skeletal fixator to counteract rotation, compression and shear forces. The IM pin here is too wide, occupying over 50% of the diameter of the medullary canal, and this meant it was only possible to place a single positive threaded ESF pin in each segment. When using an ESF to tie into an IM pin, we aim to place one to two external skeletal fixator pins in the proximal segment and the same distally. Two are definitely preferable, especially in older and larger animals. With this case here, a thinner IM pin with two ESF pins in each segment would have been better because this is a mature patient, so we need to create as much stability as we can get. Tying the IM pin into the ESF improves the overall stability of the repair by about 30%. Intermodulary pins are rarely, if ever, used alone. For the purposes of our situation, we're looking at repairing long bone fractures with an IM pin supported either with circlage wire at the fracture site or an ESF device applied, tied in or not. In some very unique circumstances, an IM pin could be used alone. For example, a reasonably stable mid-shaft long bone fracture in a young puppy. IM pins are far from ideal in open, contaminated or infected fractures. An ESF is a much better approach here in order that we can leave the infected tissue and fracture site free of metal implants and, if necessary, treat it as an open wound.
You might be in a situation, however, where IM pinning is the only procedure available to you. And in this case, I would use one rather than amputate, but I would aim to use it in a normal grade fashion and avoid the use of circlage wire at the fracture site if at all possible. Either support the IM pin with a rudimentary type 1A external fixator or use the IM pin alone if possible. External skeletal fixation is a technique that's been around for many years and has many different applications in fracture repair. The three components of external fixation are the pins themselves, the clamps and the connecting bars. We won't be discussing the more complex circular and hybrid fixators but only the linear ones as in this picture used either to supplement a repair with an IM pin or used as a sole means of fracture repair. External skeletal fixation is ideally suited to open contaminated fractures because it allows us to visualise and treat the open wounds whilst the fracture is maintained in reduction. There are several external skeletal fixation marked systems on the market, all of which require significant investment in equipment such as fixation pins, clamps, connecting bars etc. A much cheaper option for the street dog population would be to use external fixation principles and instead of using specially made clamps and connecting bars, use epoxy putty to connect the separate pins outside the limb. This will restrict us really to using external skeletal fixation as a supplement to IM pins in all but the simplest of fractures. So that's what we'll concentrate on today. As already mentioned, when using in combination with an IM pin, the IM pin should not be more than 50% of the diameter of the medullary canal at its narrowest point. The ESF pin in turn should not exceed 25% of the diameter of the bone where it is being inserted to avoid the risk of iatrogenic fracture. And this is the diameter of the bone, not the medullary canal. And I tend to aim for my ESF pins to be about 20% of the bone diameter. When used with an IM pin in the femur or humerus, the ESF can only be placed on the lateral aspect of the limb due to the body wall. When used with an IM pin in the tibia, the ESF is placed on the medial aspect of the bone where there is significantly less soft tissue to penetrate. Now we aim to place two ESF pins in both the proximal and distal segments, although with the femur and humerus it may only be possible to place one in some situations in order to avoid most of the soft tissue structures. Excessive soft tissue movement around the distal pins in femoral and humeral ESFs can lead to pin tract discharge and premature loosening of the pins. Tibial pins have much less soft tissue to penetrate on the medial aspect of this bone and so these problems are not much of an issue. External skeletal fixation used alone to repair a long bone fracture requires more pins and connecting bars than the simple construct used to supplement an IM pin. We need two to four pins per segment. There's no value in adding any more than four pins per segment. Each long bone has safe corridors in which we can place our external fixation pins without causing damage to neurovascular structures or creating too much soft tissue damage. And we can use single or multiple connecting bars. This slide is principally for reference and shows the safe corridors for ESF pin placement. Basically, we avoid the mid diaphysis region of both the femur and the humerus. And as you can see, the ESF alone is not really suitable for femoral or humeral fractures due to the lack of safe corridors and the presence of the body wall. We have a little bit more flexibility with the tibia and radius, and so these bones are more amenable to fracture fixation with an ESF construct alone. ESF pins are described as half pins which enter the bone on one side only and are connected to the connecting bar or full pins that enter the bone then exit out the other side to be attached to an additional connecting bar. This is a busy slide showing the classification of ESF frames. Here this illustrates the bone and the red line is the fracture line. The black line here is our connecting bar and the blue lines illustrate the ESF pins. This is a cranial view. Immediately below we've got a dorsal view of the same construct. The black dot illustrates the connecting bar and this is our half pin. The frames are described as either type 1A 
where we're only using half pins and there's a single connecting bar, usually on either the medial or lateral side. The next stage up is a type 1B construct, where again we're only using half pins and the bars are usually medial and cranial or lateral and cranial. These are the connecting bars, these are the pins going in and you can see from this view two connecting bars, half pins going in and this line represents the two connecting bars being connected on the outside of the limb. The next stage up is what we call a type 2 fixator. Um, a type 2 uses only full pins, that is the pin goes all the way through the bone out the other side and to a connecting bar on the other side. Um, these connecting bars are placed medially and laterally. Full pins are quite difficult to place in comparison with half pins. And then we have what's called a type 2 modified. And this is exactly the same as a type 2, but we have a combination of full pins and half pins. So you've got full pins at the top and the bottom, and we've got half pins in between. The last stage up and the most stable of all of the constructs is a type 3. Uh, and this uses, again, it uses half or full pins. And it basically, it's a combination of a type 2 and a type 1A with additional bars connecting the connecting, connecting bars, yeah, usually at the proximal and distal aspects. And these frame configurations, they're quite complex, I agree. They increase in stiffness from a 1A right up to a type 3. The other method of describing ESF frame configurations is more descriptive, saying whether the frame is uni or bilateral, and also whether or not it is uni or biplanar. And that means, does the frame exist on one side of the bone or both, and does it exist in one plane or only two? For example, our type 1A frame here would be described as unilateral and uniplanar. It exists on one side of the bone and it's only in one plane. The type 1B frame is unilateral and biplanar. Again, it exists on only one side of the bone, but it exists in two different planes. The type 2 frame would be described as bilateral and uniplanar. Um, it exists on both sides of the bone, so it's bilateral, but it exists in only one plane, so it's uniplanar. The type 2 modified is the same, it's bilateral and uniplanar. And finally, the type 3 would be described as bilateral and biplanar. It exists on both sides of the leg and it exists in two different planes. This is all theory. And in reality, in our situation, with not having access to expensive systems of clamps and connecting bars, we'll predominantly be using type 1A and type 1B frames with external fixation pins. But instead of using connecting bars and clamps, we'll be using IM pins cut to size as our connecting bars and epoxy putty to attach these to the ESF pins. This is a very simple type 1A frame with two half pins proximally and two half pins placed distally. That is the minimum needed for an ESF without an IM pin. We can see from the open growth plates here that this is a young animal and so healing should be reasonably quick. On the left, you've got your connecting bar and our four clamps. Here is a type 1B ESF frame with connecting bars both medially and cranially. I don't have x-rays unfortunately, but there are three half pins proximally and three half pins distally. Proximally, there are two cranial pins and one medially, whereas distally, there are two medial pins and one cranially. The connecting bars have been joined proximally and distally to increase the stability of the overall construct. These are images of both a type 2 and modified type 2 ESF frames. The type 2 utilises only full pins, whereas the modified type 2 utilises a combination of both full pins, proximally and distally here, and half pins. Type 2 ESF frames are technically quite difficult to construct and align accurately using connecting bars and clamps, but in actual fact this is made easier with epoxy putty since the pins do not necessarily all have to be in exactly the same plane. And this is the Type 2 fixator here in a slightly worried looking patient.
Type 3 ESF frames are the most stable and complex to put together. It is possible using epoxy putty, but in reality, this would be time consuming, messy, and incredibly difficult. So it's not something we're going to discuss. And here we have got three connecting bars, medial, cranial, and lateral, with a combination of full and half pins. And the connecting bars themselves are joined on the outside. There are three basic types of ESF pins that we can use. Trocar pins, which are smooth and should be placed into the bone at an angle to reduce pull-out strain. Negative thread Ellis pins, where the thread is cut into the pin shank. And positive thread pins, where the thread stands proud of the pin shank. Smooth trocar pins have the least holding power, followed by negative thread pins. And then positive thread pins have the best resistance to pull out. The weak point of a negative thread pin is a thread shaft junction. And so we aim to bury this within the medullary canal to protect it from excessive forces. In principle, with ESF constructs, we want a minimum of two and preferably four pins per segment when an ESF is used alone. When used with an IM pin, we want to place two pins per segment, although on occasion it may be that you can only place one, particularly in the distal humerus and femur. If repairing a fracture in a very young dog with an ESF alone, then two pins per segment will probably do since the bone will heal rapidly. If, however, you are repairing a bone in an older animal with an ESF alone, you would aim for four pins per segment. The more pins you have in each segment, the less stress there will be at the pin bone interface of each individual pin, although there's little benefit to placing more than four pins in each segment. ESF pins should not be placed through the main surgical wound, but instead through separate stab incisions, although I do have to confess I don't always manage this. Soft tissues can simply be cleared from the bone using blunt dissection. ESF, ESF pins should not be placed directly through trauma wounds. This is just a diagram to illustrate the points we just made. On the left we have an IM pin repair supported by a simple ESF with two pins in each segment. And on the right, a repair using an ESF alone with the maximum of four pins in each segment. When using an ESF alone, place the pins as near as you can to both the bone ends and the fracture, but not within half the bone diameter length of the bone end. And this is called the far, near, near, far principle. Space the pins out as evenly as you can. Pre-drill ESF pinholes using a slightly smaller drill diameter than that of the pin. Aim for about 10% smaller than the shank diameter of the ESF pin and always lavage as you drill. Place the ESF pin using a low speed drill that is under 150 RPM and avoid using the hand chuck for this since pin wobble will create oval holes which will predispose to early pin loosening. Half pins must exit the cortis on the far side. When attaching the connecting bar with the clamps or putty, the closer it is to the bone, the stiffer the construct will be. The working length of the pin is the distance between the bone and the clamp or putty, and the shorter this length, the stiffer the pin will be. So this illustrates the bone, this is our pin, this is our connecting bar, and the pin connects to the connecting bar either with a clamp or putty, and this line illustrates the skin. So the working length of the pin is the distance between where it attaches to the connecting bar and the bone. We want the clamp to be approximately one to two centimetres from the skin, or a finger's width is a good guide. Remember though, particularly at the stifle, that soft tissue thickness will change with flexion extension of the joint. And we also have to remember to allow for post-op swelling. Connecting bars can be steel, carbon fibre, titanium or epoxy putty. And we'll be talking about epoxy putty mostly because it's relatively easily available and it's cheap. The downside to epoxy putty is that it restricts us to relatively simple constructs. And once it is set, set firm, it's not possible to adjust it or to add in new pins. And we need to bear this in mind when setting the distance of the epoxy putty from the skin. If the putty sets, and then we decide it's too close to the soft tissues and likely to cause irritation, it's too late to change it. As already mentioned, the um, 
we're, we're really talking for our purposes about using type 1a frames to complement intermodullary pin fixation or type 1a or 1b frames to treat simple mid-shaft long bone fractures not amenable to IM pinning. So to summarise, in our situation, simple ESF constructs using epoxy putty will be useful in providing additional stability to long bone fractures repaired using an IM pin and for long bone fractures in young animals that will heal quickly and are not suitable for pinning. ESFs can be applied laterally to the humerus and femur to support IM pin fixations and either tied in or left free. ESFs for sole repair, that is without an IM pin, are best suited to fractures of the radius and tibia, that is below the stifle and elbow joints. ESFs can be cost effective when fixation pins are used with epoxy putty instead of expensive clamps and connecting bars and ESFs used alone are particularly useful for open infected fractures of the radius and tibia and for any fracture where we are aiming for callus formation as the means of healing. ESF metalwork is all removed after healing meaning dogs go back onto the streets without having implants in them. Problems associated with ESFs include iatrogenic fracture through the pin tract for example using too big a pin or not pre-drilling the pinhole. Pin tract infection and other soft tissue complications can be issues. The frame could get caught and damaged on furniture or branches etc. ESFs are no use when you're trying to achieve primary or direct bony union and they're a poor choice for fractures expected to take a long time to heal because the construct could easily fail before the fracture is healed. It can be more difficult, well it is more difficult to get the fracture gap reduced using an ESF alone which may hinder healing and in this situation the ESF will play a major role in weight bearing and this is because the construct is not load sharing with the bone. This could result in early pin loosening. A very stiff ESF construct combined with a large fracture gap may lead to an atrophic non-union since a fracture site is stress protected and secondary or indirect bone healing via callus formation cannot occur. Likewise, if the ESF construct is not stiff enough, the fracture won't heal and you could get a hypertrophic non-union because the bone will not form in a high strain environment. So bio biomechanical theory is complicated. Rigid fixation devices such as dynamic compression plates and screws, they reconstruct and compress the bone. So the fracture gap is small and this will favor direct bone healing. Less rigid fixation techniques such as ESFs encourage indirect bone healing. So we need to exercise care if we are to combine rigid and non-rigid fixation techniques and show respect for the manner in which bone will heal or more importantly fail to heal in each situation. Arthur Deezus wires. These are very similar to what we know as K-wires, the difference being that arthrodesis wires have a sharp trocar point at each end, whereas K-wires have a trocar point at one end and a flattened bayonet point at the other. I haven't used K-wires for years, I prefer the versatility of arthrodesis wires. If you only need a short length of wire, for example a tension band repair, then arthrodesis wires can be cut in two and used twice, therefore saving some money. Arthrodesis wires are sometimes used to help hold fracture segments in reduction while more rigid fixation is applied, but their most common uses, both of which we're going to discuss, are in the repair of growth plate fractures in young animals and in tension band repair of avulsion fractures, which also arise at growth plates. If in, in growth plate fracture repair, that is when there are no avulsion forces, Arthrodesis wires are often used alone, whereas in tension band repair of avulsion fractures, they are always used with orthopaedic cerclage wire in a figure of eight pattern. Arthrodesis wires come in a range of diameters from about 0.8 millimeters through to 2 millimeters and a range of lengths. They're basically miniature intermodullary pins. In order to use arthrodesis wires, we require an orthopaedic drill to insert them an arthrodesis wire bending tool to ensure the end is folded back against the bone surface and a tool to cut the pin short once it has been inserted. Arthrodesis wires can be inserted using the hand chuck but a low speed power drill is much preferable for accuracy in placing and to avoid pin wobble and pin bending. When inserting arthrodesis wires with your drill 
keep the working distance between the drill and the bone relatively short. These wires are thin and if you have a long working length they will bend. You should not need to pre-drill the bone prior to the placement of arthrodesis wires except perhaps for the larger 2mm ones if you're working with small bony fragments. I'll talk about the use of arthrodesis wires in the repair of avulsion fractures once we've discussed how orthopaedic cerclage wire functions, but first, first we'll make a mention of their use in growth plate or physial fractures where there are no avulsion forces involved. As you know, the physis or growth plate of the long bone sits between the epiphysis and metaphysis and in young growing dogs it is responsible for the long bone growth in length. Being constructed of cartilage predominantly, it represents a weak point in the bone and so if exposed to excessive external force, it's likely to give before the bone structure itself. From our earlier talk, we know that growth plate fractures are subdivided by the Salter classification system and it's the non-articular Salter type 1 and type 2 fractures that we aim to repair using arthrodesis wires in a crossed fashion. The physial fractures that involve the joint surface, that is the type 3 and type 4 fractures predominantly, require a more advanced approach since accurate reconstruction of the joint surface is essential. Having said that, in the situation we find ourselves in, if I'm presented with a young puppy with a Salter 3 or 4 fracture, I would still advocate the use of divergent arthrodesis wires to attempt the repair. It may not be an ideal fixation, but it is preferable to limb amputation, yeah? With physio fractures, the principle is to try and address these fractures as soon as possible after the event. These will be young dogs and excessive delay will result in the epiphyseal part of the bone being pulled away by muscle action and trying to heal in an abnormal position. Although the fracture is traumatic in origin, once the epiphysis has been dislodged at the level of the growth plate, then associated attached muscles will exert their pull and avulsion forces will then dominate. Young dogs with growth plate fractures are usually 100% lame and there's often significant soft tissue swelling associated with these injuries. Sometimes minimal trauma can result in a fracture through a growth plate and common growth plate fractures in young dogs would include those of the distal femur which is what we can see in this x-ray here. Also the distal tibia, proximal tibial plateau, sometimes including the tibial tuberosity and distal radius. Of all of these I see physial fractures of the distal femur most commonly and I'll describe the method for the, of repair for this, although the principles are the same for the other types of non-avulsion physial fractures. This image shows a distal physial fracture of the tibia in a young dog, and we can see that here. The tibial diaphysis has moved slightly cranially with respect to the distal tibial epiphysis. This is another distal femoral physial fracture, which you can see quite clearly here. The difficult bit of this fracture repair is getting the epiphyseal portion back into place at the end of the long bone. We have to handle the bone fragment gently, since being immature bone it will be softer and more easily traumatised. Depending on the length of time since the actual trauma, this might either be straightforward or incredibly difficult. I've had cases where the patient has presented a week after injury and found them very challenging to reconstruct. If possible, we want these on our operating tables within a few days of the fracture. Once the epiphysis is back in place, we need to hold the fracture in reduction while we place our cross pins, our arthrodesis wires. Accurate reduction is important due to the proximity to the joint. Normally, we use fragment reduction forceps here, and this would be advisable, although in very young dogs, you might find the points just sink into the soft bone, and in these situations, an extra pair of hands will be very useful. When handling both the epiphysis and the main segment of bone, be careful not to damage whatever is left of the growth plate. It may be that it is irreversibly damaged, but it's crucial to conserve any active physis that we can. This x-ray shows a distal femoral physial fracture repaired with multiple arthrodesis wires, but in most situations, only two would be sufficient to provide enough stability. I couldn't find an image with two when I prepared the talk, so apologies, but I have indicated in red where the two pins would be positioned ideally. Once a distal fragment is in position and the fracture is reduced, insert two arthrodesis wires of suitable size from distal to proximal, crossing over and engaging the transcortis above the fracture line. 
One of these is inserted from the medial aspect, distal to the fracture, and one on the lateral aspect, distal to the fracture. Distally, the pins start on the non-articular surfaces of the condyles, just caudal to the medial and lateral aspects of the femoral trochlea. Slight over-reduction of the distal femoral segment will assist in pin placing and gives acceptable results. Under-reduction is to be avoided and is more likely to lead to failure due to implant migration and bending or snapping. This cross-shaped application of the arthrodesis wires will give surprising stability and healing in such a young animal will be rapid. Ideally, the wires should cross over above the fracture line. So we've got fracture line here, uh, fra sorry, fracture line here and the wires crossing here, and this will give maximum stability. It is possible to insert one or both wires from proximal to distal, which some people find easier anatomically, but it requires a more extensive surgical approach and it brings a high risk of the wire penetrating the articular cartilage. I sometimes insert both pins from the lateral aspect, one from distal to proximal and the other from proximal to distal. The major problem with this type of fracture is the potential for the growth plate to have been irreversibly damaged either at the time of the initial trauma or during the surgery. Crossed arthrodesis wires provide excellent stability, but they will cause closure of any functional growth plate as the puppy grows. It's difficult to avoid this other than attempting to remove the pins after an appropriate time to try and allow continued growth plate function. Where possible in very young dogs with growth plate fractures, try to insert the arthrodesis wires in a parallel fashion to preserve as much growth plate as possible. For example, in repair of the proximal humeral head and greater tubercle physial fractures. And I'll show a diagram of this next. Arthrodesis wires can be inserted in a dynamic fashion where they're inserted at the same entry points, but instead of engaging the opposite cortis above the fracture line, they bounce off it and are reflected back to the other side in, in the fashion that rush pins are used. The wires need to be inserted at a much reduced angle, about 20 degrees to the long axis of the bone, and this method is supposed to allow the physis to continue to be active. I have never done this technique, and it is difficult to get the angles correct for the wire to function in the way it is supposed to. I don't have an x-ray of parallel pins for the repair of a greater tubercle humeral head physial fracture, so I've done this diagram. This is our humerus, with the humeral head here, greater tubercle here, growth plate here. So this is a cranial aspect and this is a caudal aspect. And here we have our two arthrodesis wires going through the greater tubercle, across the physis and into the humerus. This particular physial fracture is also under avulsion forces from the attachment of the supraspinatus tendon onto the greater tubercle here. So in all but very young dogs, we'd convert this into a tension band repair with the addition of a figure of eight cerclage wire, but I'll go into that more in the next talk. Orthopedic cerclage wire. Cerclage wire comes in rolls of varying diameter from 0.2 to 1.5 millimeters. It's used primarily to augment fracture reduction of oblique and spiral long bone fractures while supported either by an IM pin, ESF, or sometimes plate and screws. It comes either as a simple wire or with an eyelet at the end that can be used for tightening the wire. I've never used the eyelet form uh, and although it produces predictable results, it needs additional equipment and preformed loop wires. Cerclage wires are never used alone for long bone fracture repair. That's very important. That's crucial to remember. Cerclage wire is also commonly used in the repair of avulsion fractures alongside the arthrodesis wires we've just been talking about. And the only essential instrument required for using cerclage wire is a pair of wire twister cutters. You can get wire passers that assist in the passage of cerclage wire around long bones, but I've always just used the wire itself or curved artery forceps. It is vital that no soft tissue gets entrapped between the wire and the bone before tightening. In these three images, we can see that the cerclage wire is augmenting or supporting the fracture repair of an intermediary pin, an external skeletal fixation device, and arthrodesis wires. This x-ray on the right is a tension band repair of an avulsion fracture, and we'll talk more about these in a minute.
This slide is the most theoretical of the day and it is a little confusing, but we do need to discuss this in order to try and reduce complications when using circlage wire when we're repairing long bone fractures. In the repair of long bone fractures, the column of bone must be fully reconstructable, otherwise stability will not be achieved and the wire will loosen. Because the wire compresses the fracture fragments together, there will be either no or a very small fracture gap and primary direct bone healing will occur. And to this end, the strain at the fracture site must be kept very low, that is under 2%. And so rigid fixation must be used too in order to protect the fracture site from strain. Now this will occur with a rigid ESF construct or a plate. An intermodellary pin, plus or minus a simple ESF, will not provide sufficient stability for primary direct bone healing to occur since the fracture site will be exposed to micromotion and this simply means that callous healing will occur. Where plates and complex ESFs are not an option, as with most of our cases, care needs to be taken here because by creating a very small fracture gap, all of the strain is concentrated in a very small area. And if there is not sufficient support provided by the IM pin or ESF, or we don't use the, wire, the circlage wire correctly, then we might get a failure of fixation. Remember that by compressing an oblique fracture using, for example, three circlage wires, we create a very narrow or no fracture gap and a rigid fixation environment at the fracture site. If we then use a much less stiff IM pin or ESF to support the repair, we're using a much less rigid system, and this potentially will cause a stress riser effect at the fracture site and increase the risk of the bone there fracturing further. So basically, it's better to support a rigid fracture repair environment with a rigid plate ESF to avoid this risk and achieve primary direct bone healing or to opt for a much less rigid or stiff approach altogether, both at the fracture site itself and supporting it, and aim for secondary indirect bone healing. So in theory, the combination of a rigid stiff local repair environment at the fracture site, and we're usually talking about a lag screw, but in this case, circlage wire, that's best supported by a rigid stiff plate, but we don't have this luxury, but we do need to understand and appreciate the theory. Circlage wire can be used in other manners with long bone fractures, such as in interfragmentary wiring, hemicirclage wiring, etc. But these aren't often applicable, and so I won't be covering them here. Orthopedic circlage wire may sound like a simple implant to employ, but in actual fact, for it to work properly, we need to be very careful with its application technique. If circlage wire loosens, then not only does the fracture destabilise, but the offending wire can cause irritation to the bone as it moves up and down, and this can prevent or hinder revascularization of the bone and the periosteum. There are definite rules when using circlage wire in the stabilisation of long bone fractures, which if we fail to observe will likely lead to failure of our fracture repair. Orthopaedic circlage wire must only be used when we have complete anatomic reconstruction of the bone circumference. Without this, the fracture reduction will collapse as we tighten that wire. Orthopaedic circlage wire should only be used in long oblique or spiral fractures, where the length of the fracture line is more than twice the diameter of the bone. If we apply circlage wire to shorter oblique fractures, as the wire is tightened, the fracture line is exposed to shearing forces rather than compression forces. Never place a single circlage wire. It will act as a pivot point and a stress riser. Always use a minimum of two wires and preferably more. Circlage wire should be placed one centimetre or half the bone diameter apart and not closer than five millimetres to the end of the fracture segment. Use wire large enough for the bone. If you're in doubt, err on the side of larger wire rather than smaller and ensure that it is tight. When placing multiple circlage wires, go back and re-tighten the earlier ones since as you place more, the compression increases, creating the possibility that the earlier placed wires could possibly become slightly loose. Twisting orthopaedic circlage wire. This is where many people make mistakes. It is vital that both ends are grasped with the wire twister cutter and tension applied before twisting commences. You must apply the tension before you start to twist. I usually cross the wires over once before grasping with the wire twister cutters. Twist the wire until it is tight. 
It was previously recommended to fold the wire flat against the bone and cut away any excess, leaving about eight twists. Now this actually creates a weak point since you can lose up to 70% of the tension as you fold the wire down. Twisting as you fold it down helps reduce this. The other option is to leave the wire standing perpendicular to the bone and cut it leaving only three to four twists. Any less than this and the tension achieved will be reduced by approximately 20%. In well-covered bones such as the femur and the humerus, it would be wise to leave the wire proud and cut it off after three to four twists. When working on the medial tibia, for example, it might be necessary to fold the wire against the bone to prevent irritation to the overlying skin. The use of arthrodesis wire and orthopaedic cerclage wire together in tension band repairs. As previously mentioned, avulsion fractures occur predominantly in younger dogs and are the result of external forces acting directly on the bone itself or forces that result in increased pull of muscle masses that effectively pull the bony segment off the main bone. Common avulsion fractures we see occur at the tibial tuberosity with the attachment of the patellar tendon and the olecranon process of the ulna with the triceps tendon attaches. Other avulsion fractures you may come across include the os calcis with the attachment of the gastrocnemius tendon, the greater trochanter of the femur where the gluteal muscles attach, and the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula where we've got the attachment of the biceps brachii muscle. As with non-avulsed physio fractures, we want to repair the fracture using implants that will do the least possible damage to the growth plate, which generally means using arthrodesis wires. Again, to encourage the continued function of the growth plate, removal of implants once healing has occurred, often three to four weeks in very young dogs, may improve the chances of the growth plate being functional. In theory, arthrodesis wires inserted perpendicular, perpendicularly to the growth plate do less damage, but as we've already seen with physial fractures of the distal femur, they may need to cross over to provide enough stability. The major difference between the repair of growth plate fractures at the end of long bones and avulsion fractures through growth plates is the forces that act on them. Repair of avulsion fractures requires not only the fracture to be reduced and held in place, but the avulsion forces to be neutralised, or the repair will fail. Tension band repair of avulsion fractures. This diagram is to illustrate the forces, indicated in red arrows here, at play in this type of fracture repair, before and after the repair. We'll talk about the specifics of repairing these later on in surgical detail. Tension band repair involves the use of arthrodesis wires, illustrated in black here, and cerclage wire, illustrated in blue, in a figure of eight pattern. The principle is that by using arthrodesis wires and cerclage wire, we can counteract the tension or avulsive forces created by the pull of the muscle on the bony fragment with the use of the cerclage wire and convert these into a compressive force which will push the bony fragment into reduction and allow primary or direct bony healing to occur. The arthrodesis wires hold the bony fragment in place. They are drilled through the centre of the fragment once it's reduced into the main bone right through to the far cortis if possible and they act as an anchor for the cerclage wire which passes through a hole drilled transversely in the bone on the opposite side of the fracture site and fixed in a figure of eight pattern and tightened. The pull of the muscle is counteracted by the wire and the resultant vector forces are converted into a compressive force across the fracture site. And the best analogy I can think of to explain this, and I'll show it in the next slide, would be that of the old fashioned tent, where the guy ropes represent the pull of the tendon and counter pull of the wire, and the resulting combined vector force is directed into the ground with the tent pole acting as our arthrodesis wire. Once the wire is secured, the arthrodesis pin ends are bent away from the wire and cut off, and the wire ends are also bent flush to the bone and cut off similar to how we described with cerclage wiring of long bone fractures. This illustrates the tent analogy I was talking about where the guy ropes to each side represent the pull and the counter pull of the patellar tendon against the cerclage wire and the resultant vector force is directed down the arthrodesis wires as the cerclage wire is tightened. As with cerclage wire, there are a few simple rules we need to follow. 
It's preferable to use two arthrodesis wires placed parallel to each other to provide better rotational stability, although in very small avulsion fractures, if there's a risk of the fragment splitting, you might only be able to place one. The arthrodesis wire should be placed perpendicular to the fracture line and the tips should enter the far cortex to provide maximum stability. The transverse hole for the cerclage wire should be at least as far from the fracture line as the entry point of the arthrodesis wire is preferably slightly further. Use a single wire and a single twist in the upper half of the figure of eight. Looping the wire opposite the loose ends in the upper half of the eight would allow two twists, which will provide even more tension, but will also give you a lot more material to bury. I use a single wire twist for most applications and I'll show you this in a diagram. Here's an x-ray and diagram to illustrate the tension band repair of a tibial tuberosity from the craniocaudal viewpoint. It's not the best x-ray, but it shows the two parallel arthrodesis wires and a figure of eight tension band cerclage wire with the twists in the upper half. For these, I now only use one twist on the lateral aspect where I can easily bury the wire under the soft tissue. But this is an old x-ray when I was making two twists. So this is proximal tibia. The dotted line represents the tibial tuberosity fragment. The black lines are the arthrodesis wires and the blue is our cerclage wire. And here we have got one twist on the lateral aspect.